We're going to take a few moments here in the middle of our service to celebrate the Lord's death. We do so at the table of communion. And we're going to look at the Bible together in preparation for these moments. And so we want you to be able to follow along. If you don't have a Bible this morning, just slip your hand up and some men will come forward and put a Bible in your hands. If you don't own a Bible, we would love for you to have your own copy of God's Word. So keep this as a gift if you do not own one. I'd like to turn your attention this morning in preparation for the Lord's table to Isaiah chapter 1. The prophet Isaiah. And we'll be looking at verse 18. Isaiah chapter 1 is the beginning of Isaiah's prophetic ministry. And the first chapter of the book begins a series of stinging indictments of the nation. God looks down at his people Israel and sees through the pretense of mere outward religious observance. They had sacrifices. They went to the temple. They did their religious duties. And yet God had had enough of the mere externalism. While their lives internally were corrupt and not devoted to him from the heart. God, in fact, calls Israel Sodom and Gomorrah in Isaiah chapter 1. And yet you have this remarkable invitation in Isaiah 1.18, and I want us to focus our attention on this verse. Listen to these gracious words to sinners from a holy and offended God. God says through the prophet, come now. And let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. What we find here in Isaiah's words is gospel, good news of salvation for sinners. We find here God's grace, a grace which justifies and transforms. Now Isaiah himself would go on to have a ministry declaring God's salvation to an obstinate people who would not listen by and large. Though there would be a remnant of belief, the nation would go on to reject their own Messiah. And yet there is a day coming where God will keep his promise to that rebellious nation and draw them in full in faith in Messiah. In the meantime, we Gentiles get to read these gracious verses with the same heart from an offended God whose standard of holiness is a standard of perfection, a standard that none of us could meet. Every one of us has been by nature and by deeds a lawbreaker. Therefore, we have discredited ourselves from the knowledge of God, from the presence of God, from any benefit of a gracious relationship with God, except God initiate in mercy and kindness and forgive our sin. Christian, you're here this morning in Christ about to celebrate his death on the cross in your place with a couple of symbols, a piece of bread representing his body and a cup of juice representing his blood spilled in our place. And we have come to these words, this gracious invitation to Yahweh, the the God who says, come, let us get together. Let us discuss these things. I will make your sins that are red like scarlet, red like blood, I will make them white like snow and like wool. Here's the promise of God. For all those washed in the blood of his son, perfect forgiveness is granted by grace. A once for all time declaration that the sinner who was guilty is now declared in God's courtroom to be right, to be just as if he had never done anything wrong and as if he had always done all things right. It is the only way God's perfect standard of righteousness could be met, as if that standard was met by someone other than the sinner. 
Someone who has not broken the standard. Someone who is righteous, who died in the place of the wicked. This is a good news of substitution. Isaiah would go on to tell us in chapter 53 how Messiah himself would come and stand in the place of sinners and be crushed under the hand of his Father to bring us to God. We celebrate that, believers, this morning. If you're here this morning and you are not a Christian, you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, you have not yet been washed by the blood of his Son. You need to know this, you still remain in your sins. And the offense of God's holiness still hangs over you. And this, friend, could be a day of salvation for you. A day of salvation which would justify, declare you as righteous before God, and a day of salvation which would transform. Make you into a new creature and give you a new life, a new way of living a new heart, new desires, new inclinations. If you're here still outside of Christ, this invitation stands. Come to God, who is ready to speak with you on these terms. Your sins are as scarlet. He will make them white as snow. Only on the basis of the death of his son, If you're here this morning and you refuse to embrace Christ, just let the symbols pass you by. That bread and that juice are reminders for those who have already been forgiven of their sins. But consider the state of your heart. Consider eternity. Consider this gracious offer from an offended God to wipe the slate clean and to change your life. We'll have a few moments of silence as the men come forward. You can come now and distribute those symbols. In these moments of silence, interrogate your own heart. Be encouraged by the good news of forgiveness of sin. Revel all over again in what Christ has done. And believers, examine your heart. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 to examine your own heart in this moment. If there is any sin unchecked, unconfessed, take this moment now and confess that to the Lord. Enjoy once again the forgiveness purchased for you at the cross. Take a few moments now and prepare your heart. Hold on to those symbols and we will take them together in a moment.